No one told him the Night's Watch would be like this. John wondered if his father had known what the wall would be like. He must have, he thought. That only made it worse. Hi everybody, welcome to another rereading Game of Thrones video. We are exploring today John 3 from a Game of Thrones of the Song of Ice and Fire book series, obviously. In this chapter, we get introduced to the wall for the first time. And we also get to see how different older male characters serve as kind of foster fathers for the bastard 14 year old boy who is all alone in the grimmest and coldest place known to man. John has a nice little arc in this chapter and he grows and learns from the many lessons these mentor figures try to teach him along the way. If this is your first time in this channel, don't be shy. Subscribe, subscribe. And to never miss any of our rereading videos, click that nice little bell near the subscribe button. Hmm? I'd also like to give a shout out to recent patrons, Matt Anderson from Finland and Niena, and also to Marie Thomas, who has sent her generous contributions several times to our PayPal page. Thank you, Matt, Niena, and Marie. If you'd like to join them, the links are in the description. So. The Five Fathers. These are Alice Thorne, Benjamin Stark, Donald Noyle, Tyrion Lannister, and Lord Commander Jeor Mormont. They all play a part in this chapter, helping John grow, understand life, understand the world he's in, and how to operate in this world. All are classically archetypical father type advice and roles. So John the bastard who grew up without a mother and a missing father who couldn't actually raise him in any meaningful way because of the horrible stepmom Caitlin who despised him. John has now been banished to the gulag. <laughs> he thought he was getting to a place that will allow him to be all he can be but his fantasies were shattered in the face of the sad and grim and gray and cold, harsh reality that is the wall. Tantamount to a life sentence in prison. And the rooms where the soldier at the wall sleep at are called cells. And John, it is said to him, is there for life. He is the loneliest person in the loneliest place on earth. His birthday came and went and not even his uncle Benjen noticed <laughs> a birthday does anybody care about birthdays at the wall his black brothers have found friends they laugh together they keep each other company John is by himself in Siberia a cold place and the people there are even colder so understandably John is upset life is not fair so he lashes out but does it within the official rules by kicking the asses of all the new recruits showing off his chops when it comes to fighting. Mm. This does not endear him on the master at arms, Alistair Thorne, John's first father figure in this chapter. Nor does it endear him, needless to say, on his new black brethren, whom he despises. He may be a bastard, but he's better than they are. They're thugs uneducated good-for-nothing common folk. He'd forgotten their names. He hardly ever spoke to them if he could help it. They were brutes and bullies without a thimble of honor between them. Ah, honor. They, on the other hand, are angry that he makes them look bad. So they call him bastard to bring him down a few notches. Because in this hierarchical medieval society, one needs to know who is above who in the pecking order. Is acceptance get higher on the totem pole than a castle raised rich bastard mm. so into this dream turned nightmare reality this lord of the flies world comes in good old sir alice thorn to provide the lost boy with some direction by bullying him around john says that thorn hates him but that he hates the other people he's training even more, so it's not personal. It's just Thorne's attempt at teaching through derision, preparing them for life, 
He is there in the chapter to make it clear to John that his old life is behind him for good and that he should prepare for the harshness of his life sentence. Let's go to the second father figure in this chapter, Benjamin Stark. So John runs to Uncle Benjamin to complain about Alistair. Mm, Sir Alistair has been mean to me. And John wants to skip the line thanks to the familiar relations that they have. But Uncle Ben has a few lessons of his own. I don't know you. Stop calling me. New phone, who dis? Benjamin explains to John that he is but a green boy with the smell of summer and that nothing on the wall is given and everything is earned. Benjamin doesn't even smile at John. He wants to make his point as clear as day. No special favors, no special status. Fend for yourself. At the wall, much like in nation states, the family loyalties are relegated to second place. The national loyalties are the law of the land. Your father will always have a place in my heart, but these are my brothers now. Benjamin gestured with his dagger at the men around them. All hard, cold men in black. And then Benjamin goes to look for Sir Waymire Royce, whom the others killed in the prologue. So here is another lesson to John. This shit's real. It's dangerous. Bye bye, Benjamin. It was nice to know you. Okay, Donald Noy. He is the third father figure and the most interesting one to me. He's the armorer at the watch. And as he breaks up a scuffle between John and his new brothers that was about to escalate, he shares with John a few inconvenient truths. One, you're no better than anyone. Just relax. Two, even the lowest of the low can succeed at the wall. Three, they're afraid of you. That's why they hate you. Four, you're no hotshot. It's the others who have never held a proper sword. And five, if you don't change your tune, you will be shanked in prison. Mm. But actually, Noi starts out with some Buddhist shit. Words won't make your mother a whore. She was what she was, and nothing Toad says can change that. You know, we have men on the wall whose mothers were whores. John throughout this chapter, but especially with Noi, is acting like the child that he is. He's being petulant. I don't care. John said, I don't care about them and I don't care about you or Thorn or Benjamin Stark or any of it. I hate it here. It's too, it's, it's cold. And he complains that Noy at least had a life before he got to the wall. Apparently he's the one who forged King Robert's hammer. And John idealizes the life that he had before he was old, which for John means 30. That's when he joined the watch. He fought in wars, in battles. Ooh. So the fact that nothing at the wall is anything like it's in the stories and the songs doesn't make John question other heroic stories and songs. And John stops to object only when Donald Noel takes away from him his sense of victory that he beat up the other recruits and he calls him a bully. Best you start thinking, Noy warned him. That or sleep with a dagger by your bed. Now go. And on he goes into the arms of the fifth father figure. Tyrion motherfucking Lannister. Tyrion, he's not cold to him at all. He's the truth teller. But we also just found out in the previous chapter, Caitlin 4. Go check it out if you haven't. That Tyrion is the one who provided the assassin with the Valyrian steel dagger to assassinate Bran. So we're kind of disoriented. Littlefinger said that he lost the knife, the dagger, to Tyrion. And Tyrion was there at Winterfell. And he's a Lannister. Mm. Tyrion's role as a father figure here is to protect Jon, mostly emotionally. He tells him again to take control of his bastardness and make it his own so that the others will stop mocking him. And he also threatens Alice Thorne with murder since he is part of the royal court as the queen's brother in response to the emotional abuse of John. Surrounded by all these outcasts, 
Tyrion of House Lannister, the Queen's brother, is probably the most important visitor the Wall has seen for decades. And another role that Tyrion takes upon himself is to open up Jon's mind when he catches him staring at the Wall. Makes you wonder what lies beyond, a familiar voice said. Jon looked around. Uh, Lannister, I, I didn't see, I mean, I mean, I thought I was alone. I think this was John trying not to offend <laughs> Tyrion, that he didn't see him because he's small. There's much to be said for taking people unawares. You never know what you might learn. Later he says to John, oh, I learn things everywhere I go. And why is it that when one man builds a wall, the next man immediately needs to know what's on the other side? You do want to know what's on the other side, don't you? And then John replies with the worst <laughs> boom card it confirmed ever. He said, it's nothing special. Yeah. Then Lord Commander Geor Mormont, he's the last father figure in this chapter. And he's there to give John the bad news about life. That Bran is crippled. Mm. Though John doesn't care. He's just happy that his brother is alive, or half-brother, as Alice Thorne makes sure that he understands. John is so happy that he takes in the lessons that he has been taught and offers Gren and the others to teach them how to fight. That results in Thorne cracking a joke and John cracking one back at his expense. The entire dining room full of black brothers is silent and then... Everyone erupts in laughter. <laughs> and Thorne gives his final lesson for the day. That was a grievous error, Lord Snow. He said at last in the acid tones of an enemy. Now it's time to turn our sights to the wall, which we're seeing from up close for the first time. The most beautiful writing in this chapter is about the wall. We also learn about the Night's Watch and that the watch, like everything else in the realm, is not what it used to be. Only three of the 19 strongholds along the wall are occupied and are in disrepair. But I'd like to end this video with some of Martin's descriptions of the wall. Enjoy. As he stood outside the armory looking up, John felt almost as overwhelmed as he had that day on the King's Road when he'd seen it for the first time. The wall was like that. Sometimes he could almost forget that it was there, the way you forgot about the sky or the earth underfoot. But there were other times when it seemed as if there was nothing else in the world. It was older than the Seven Kingdoms. And when he stood beneath it and looked up, it made John dizzy. Even after all these weeks, the sight of it still gave him shivers. A colossal blue-white cliff that filled up half the sky. The largest structure ever built by the hands of men, Benjamin Stark has told him. You could see it from miles off, a pale blue line across the northern horizon, stretching away to the east and west and vanishing in the far distance, immense and unbroken. This is the end of the world it seemed to say. Castle Black, its timbered keeps and stone towers looked like nothing more than a handful of toy blocks scattered on the snow beneath the vast wall of ice. The ancient stronghold of the Black Brothers was no Winterfell, no true castle at all lacking walls. It could not be defended, not from the south or east or west, but it was only north that concerned the Night's Watch. His uncle, said the top was wide enough for a dozen armored knights to ride abreast. The gaunt outlines of huge catapults and monstrous wooden cranes stood sentry up there like the skeletons of great birds and among them walked men in black as small as ants. You could feel the great weight of all that ice pressing down on him as if it were about to topple, and somehow John knew that if it fell, the world fell with it. Yes, yes, yes. 
very good George boy. Ladies and gentlemen, George R. R. Martin. Even Tyrion cannot remain cynical in front of the wall. At first, when they were very far away, Jon said he had a few japes, but as they drew closer, he kept his mouth shut. Whew, what a wonderful, wonderful chapter. As Jon grows, so does the realm. We started out the story up north, with a little bit in Essos, and then the last chapter with Caitlin, we saw the capital of the Seven Kingdoms. And in this chapter, we see the edge of the Seven Kingdoms. <laughs> There's a lot to look forward to. So if you haven't subscribed, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell to not miss any of those rereading videos. And since I recorded the chapter, I got a new patron, Jessica Marenga. Hi, Jessica. She already wrote me a nice note. I wrote back, welcome aboard. And if you would like to also be welcomed aboard, you are most welcome to join our Patreon page. The link is in the description. It's patreon.com slash gotacademy. Or if you're more into one-time donations, that will also be very much appreciated. The link is also down there. It's paypal.me slash gotacademy. So this is only my second time reading this story, but I'm reading every chapter three or four times. So I feel like I'm getting two, three, four times worth of rereading in one, in one time, really digging into each chapter themes, what's going on, what's most interesting to talk about in this chapter. So I hope you enjoy it. If you did, hit the like button, uh, put a comment down below to help the algorithm, uh, you know, generate engagement and uh, all kinds of uh, stuff like that. And I'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody.